Major funding for these programs has been provided by grants from Capital One Bank and Perfect Building Maintenance, Murray Hill Properties, SJP Properties, Greenberg Traurig, New York Community Bank, Bank of America. Additional funding for these programs has been provided by grants from Akron Gold Brothers, LLC, C.B. Richard Ellis, City Investment Fund, Cushman and Wakefield, Eastern Consolidated, XL Realty Advisors, LP, Essex Capital Partners, First American Title Insurance Company of New York, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, GVA Williams, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Helmsley Spear, Herbert J. Sims and Company, Herrick Feinstein, LLP, Jackson Development Group, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, John Katsimatidis, Kilroy Metal Products, Marcus and Millichap, Massey Knackle Realty Services, M and T Bank, Madison Realty Capital, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Must Development, Palin Enterprises, Rosenthal and Rosenthal, Signature Bank, Sheldrake Organization, Sterling and Sterling, Stephen Napolitano, Stonehenge Partners, Studley, The Moynan Organization. Hello, my name is Michael Stoller. You know, there is something in this world called appraisers, valuation of what property is worth. I don't know. I'm not an appraiser. I never. I was an accountant when I started, but I, I never took that field of appraisal. So in today's crazy, crazy world of real estate, one has to determine what's happening with values of different properties. So I've assembled literally the deans of the Appraisal Institute, the who's who of the Appraisal Institute, to tell my audience about the world of appraisal. My guests today include Brian Corcoran, Executive Vice President, Global Head of Valuation Services for Cushman and Wakefield, Steve Schleider, uh, President, Metropolitan Valuation Services, uh, Jamie Malloy, uh, Director of Valuation Services globally for the Deutsche Bank. And last but not least, Joel Leitner, President of the Leitner Group. What's happening in today's world that everybody is crazy, people don't know what values are? What's happening today with values on real estate in the tri-state region? Well, values, like everybody else's portfolio, have been negatively affected. Values are down. There's no doubt about it. The hard part for those of us in the appraisal field is we don't have transactions to measure the actual decline. We need market activity, comparable sales to look at, to extract rates, and to determine the impact on value that's occurred. We know it's down. It's very hard for us to estimate exactly how much. So, so what happens, you know, and this is open, you know, Jamie, you know, Deutsche Bank has 15, domestically, $15 billion of loans on the books. How do they, how do they go to you from Germany or from the American operation and they say to you, well, what's, what's, what's the value? How much are these office buildings worth today? What's this land worth today? What, what's this? Yeah, I mean, because you're probably under this pressure of, of they want to know what it is. How do you, what do you tell them? Well, uh, Michael, it's looking at uh, very carefully a series of assumptions, including declining rents, increasing vacancies, and uh, doing your best from a top-down and bottom-up uh, approach to estimate what those cash flows are going to be in the future. From there, you uh, handicap. Estimate? Yes. That's a question. In the past, maybe there was too much estimation in the wrong way. Could that be, Mr. Schleider? Could be. Could be. As appraisers, we... Um, I'm not picking on any of you. I'm we, just saying the estimation of that information that Brian says, you know, with regard to transactions or estimation from the brokers, you know, the real estate brokers who sell the property, or the estimations from the people who sell. I mean, that's what it is. It's an estimation. It's not a clear, concise study, is it? It's an estimation based on a point in time. 
based on what has happened up to that point in time with some little bit of forward looking. Um, we reflect the activities of market participants, Michael. And if buyers, uh, debt, are looking at, at certain set of assumptions and holding the world to be a certain way, that's what they're basing their real estate investment decisions upon. We see that in a history of transactions leading up to a certain point in time, and we use that as a basis for a metric to determine a valuation for a particular piece of property that we're looking at currently. So if, if I'm listening to Brian, who's saying that there's limited number of transactions, I'm listening to Jamie, who's saying that it, trends are, you know, rents aren't doing that well, cash flows are down. So what's, what's value is happening, Mr. Leitner? Well, you also have to look uh, forward uh, a bit, as, as Steve uh, said. And uh, looking forward to next year is, is, uh, is unfortunately not too pleasant. The, the fundamentals are eroding in uh, real estate in the New York metro area. I mean, you know, the, the big story, you know, that, that happened, and this doesn't relate, was in the New York Times on the, you know, the, the, the rating agencies, who in, in most cases never really looked at your information. They, they felt that they were, they knew it above and beyond. all. They didn't need appraisers. They, they had these 22-year-old analysts who went out to see the property and determined that the rents could go to any numbers over there. Today, my question is, with a limited number of transactions that Brian brings up to the reality and the fact that we don't have comparable sales or other things how how you know, somebody says to you okay how much is that property worth we were talking before in the studio Williamsburg everybody loved Williamsburg it's the hot space you know Ricky's is opening up in Williamsburg you know you take the L trade it's a place that you really want to be you know your daughter would love being there in, in this situation what's what's land worth in Williamsburg it's judgment based on what has happened up until this point and what and what will happen in the future. Stop being so evasive. What is it worth? How much is it down? How much is it down? It's. Uh, Do you want me to take the coin and flip? You know, Hand some up. It, it's down significantly, as are all the other forms of okay. investment. Okay, Mr. Malloy, prior to the show, said the probably the best property in New York City today is the Drake site. You said the value is down. How much in your opinion, in your humble opinion? I, I'm not exactly sure, Michael. Is it, worth, is it down 10 percent, 20 percent? I think it's uh, probably more than that at this but point. But part of the reason, and I'm not putting it in the spot, is that I think Brian or Steve said or, or Joel said, you know, that value maybe was arbitrate because people felt it couldn't sell for any price. So the, the, the question is, you know, People always ask me, you know, both in the residential subject and in the commercial, should I buy an apartment today? What do you say? I, I mean, you're appraisers. There must be people who come to you and say, is the market down? You know, Steve, I know where you live. My wife and I lived in the building. You know, it's a good building. How much is property down at 401 E 74th Street? Thanks for the address. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, in your own humble opinion, from the height. From the height, could be 10%, 15%. Brian, what do you think about residential? I think it's down more than that. Um, I have a good friend who's an attorney at uh, Schulte Roth, been a close friend of mine for a long time, has been moved in, sold his home on Long Island, moved into the city about seven years ago, and rented in Litwin's building, the Lucerne, on 79th and 1st. And he's been asking me that very question. And about two weeks ago, I told him, in my opinion, now is a good time to buy. I think the numbers of more than 10 or 15 percent is proven by folks that are walking away from contracts that they have 10 or 15 percent down. They, I don't think most folks will walk away from contracts but with you, 10 or 15 percent down if values haven't come down by a little bit more. I think you have to look at what type of apartment, where it's located. Is it new construction? Was the pricing for the new construction maybe hyperinflated? Was it not sustainable under any market condition? And then, of course, people are going to be walking away. But if you're looking at a, an established co-op building that has um, a history of sales activity, that has stability, that has good reserve funds, uh, and still presents a good housing opportunity and an opportunity to generate wealth for the, for the homeowner once this market turmoil turns around, 
I don't see how it would fall into that you know, global type of uh, uh, market markdown. Well, I would submit, I would agree with that up until when Lehman went bankrupt. I honestly believe that the real estate market in New York is different today, fundamentally, than it was September 10th. I'm not saying it's not. Be before Lehman. You have a great deal of the residential market. It depends on Wall Street. And, and if the people don't have jobs and if they don't have, feel good about the jobs that they have and they're not going to get good bonuses, their ability to buy co-ops and condos in Manhattan is directly impacted. When you couple that with the fact that financing, although the money is th supposed to be there, we haven't really seen the spigots opened in terms of financing for real estate. Those, those two factors together, to me, uh, portray a, a declined market. I, I got to give before the, let Steve in to make the comment. Someone told me that they were at a meeting where they heard the legendary Leonard Litwin, who you and I have the highest regard for, say to to these two younger guys, who are not two younger guys, they were our contemporaries, uh, Douglas Durst and Dan Brodsky, he says, kids, <laughs> let me tell you, you're in for a lot. And here's a good story, and it's a question of values. Uh, someone tells me a story yesterday about an apartment that he's renting on Columbus Avenue and 60th Street. And it's a three bedroom, three bath, 49th floor, totally renovated apartment, relatively brand new building. And I said, what, 7,000? He said, no, 5,100. Now, that apartment was $7,000 in January, February of this year. Take Leonard Litwin's building at 75th Street and 2nd, not too far from you. Here's a building, top building. I know a number of people who were living in a junior four apartment in that building. They were paying $5,100. Two weeks ago or a week ago, some people I know went to the same building, looked at an apartment, higher floor, totally renovated, that 5100 is now 3800 So there is something happening. So following that approach, somebody says to Malloy or to Leitner or to Schleider or to you, give me a valuation on this building. You know, the rents may have been artificially higher. You know, there were apartments at my friend Ophir Denny's building on 48th Street and 8th Avenue. He was getting $3,800 for a one-bedroom. He had kids in the advertising business, in the media business. The, world, the market was better. He had people from Lehman Brothers living there. Those people aren't there. Those people are moving to the Bronx. They're moving to other places. Michael, on, on that rent structure that, that, that you just cited, uh, is that an effective rent or is that a face rent? Because face it, rent. It's a face rent. It's, We've seen the rents in Times Square. We're, we're, we're involved in a situation where we've appraised a building three times in the last four months. Uh, Couldn't get it right yet. Well, <laughs> the market's close. the market's changing so fast in this in this building. It's a high rise in Times Square that caters to um, those with first time job opportunities to New York. You know, their their rent their leases are nine months to to a year, and it's a constant churning. And we're seeing the the market rent plummet in this building, and the marketplace. So you're seeing this absolutely happen. yes. I I, I mean. When I heard these two examples, you know, I, I, I couldn't believe it, and it's effective. It's not, you know, it's not the deal with three months free rent and this and that. This is the true effect of rents that are happening. Now, what's happening in the office rents? I mean, you, you, have, you guys have a lot of portfolio in office. It's a similar situation. Um, the whole employment picture is very negative at the moment, and... Uh, Order of magnitude, you hear uh, effective rents, 50% uh, of uh, the former uh, levels. I mean, let, let's look in Lower Manhattan as a good example, because it hasn't really happened yet, but it could happen. You have, you have uh, Merrill Lynch taken over by Bank of America. Merrill Lynch has 5.5 million square feet you know, about 5 million square feet downtown. You have AIG on the balls of its rear, uh, 2.8 million square feet. You have uh, Goldman Sachs moving from their present headquarters, all their buildings, to their new tower. It's effectively 8.5 million square feet of space. It's not needed by everybody. And it's good quality space. It's great quality space, but it's not needed by everybody. You know, so I, I hear today on my panel with Jim Kuhn, he says, so they'll convert some of the space to re residential. And my comment is, you can't. This is not 1994. 
when office buildings were selling for $75 to $100 a foot. This is not the time that there were 421Gs, full tax abatements. So, I mean, where do you see the values of an office? I mean, you just you know, gave us some ideas on a residential building. How much do you think the value of your building in Times Square that you just said that you've reappraised three times? Well, it's gone down significantly each time. 30 percent? That's about that? right. So it's <clears> down 30 percent. What do you think office buildings are down? That's case-by-case case basis, because there you have long-term leases. And so you do have some office buildings with, with below market rents. Can I, can rents I ask a place. simple question? Somebody once said to me, it was credit tenants. Wasn't AIG a credit tenant up Ooh, to... Look at Lehman Brothers. Wasn't AIG, <laughs> wasn't Lehman Brothers? Couldn't Morgan Stanley go out of business before? I mean, all of these <coughs> major houses could have gone out of business. These were credit tenants. So it doesn't mean anything. I don't think there's a credit tenant. If you go through the analysis that Jamie was talking about before and you estimate what the current market rent is and what the current concessions are, which are much wider than they were, and you look at doing a cash flow model, discount rates are up, terminal caps are up, um, overall values, the impact of that is a 30 to a 40 percent drop in value for a stabilized office building. So Forget here, a building here, here's inside. my question. You're not lenders, but lenders, or the due to the securitization market, certain banks and institutions or lenders may have lent based on projections that that office building on Third Avenue would be renting for hundred dollars a foot. There were certain office buildings, and there were office buildings. I'll give you a good example: the the office tower at six 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 Fifth Avenue was sold because people thought the rents were going to be a hundred and thirty dollars a foot. It's not going to be $130 a foot. I mean, I heard today Jimmy Kuhn and Steve Siegel saying, we always track the top 30 buildings in New York. The top 30 buildings have higher vacancy than they had before. The hedge funds are out of business. They're not taking spaces. This is a question. So really what I'm trying to get from all of you is where you see the worst value, because I, I think Steve Schleider said prior to the show, probably in the rent-stabilized, lower-income rent-stabilized property, the least reduction in value yes. has taken place, right? And I think... In certain areas of the city where those values hadn't come up. <clears throat> now, Joel is saying in like these transient Times Square brand new buildings where you had a lot of yuppies and all the rest, we can see maybe a 30 percent reduction in value. As of now. And, it, and it's probably going to be getting worse next year. And, wh and what do you feel with regard to Midtown office or downtown office, because I know your office is downtown? I think the, the uh, metrics that Brian quoted, 30 to 40 percent for a, um, uh, an occupied building, multi-tenant, is about right. And, and what about that, that other asset class known as, we were talking part of the show, Steve was talking about all the vacant stores that you can see right now on First and Second Avenue, retail. What do, we, what do we see retail valuations now? Anybody want to? I think retail is the next problem area. Um, we're going to see some real trouble in retail, especially after the holiday season. I don't think sales are going to be good. And I think you're going to see a lot of retailers just hanging on to get through the first of the year. And then, then there'll be even more vacancies than we see now. And you also have the situation in, in almost all sectors. There's no urgency to do anything. Everyone, office tenants, believe it's going to get worse. So why rush out and sign a lease today if it's a month from now it might be even less? I think you're going to see the same thing in retail. You're seeing more and more space being put on the market with less demand. I think that has to do with the velocity of sales transactions, too. Investors are sitting on the sidelines saying, well, why should I buy today, next week, or next month? It may be a lower price. Which is exactly what I said prior to the show. People all of these real estate investment funds, all of these strong people who have money are saying, you know, I might as well hold it. I mean, my, my colleagues at Madison Realty Capital were mentioning they went to a, they were in Europe for about 10 days meeting with investors. And the private banks, the family funds, the, the, all of these wealthy organizations, their clients are saying, I just want to keep it in cash. I don't want to put it in the stock market. I don't want to do anything else. I just want to keep it simple because I don't know where I should make an investment. We don't have an orderly market. Plain and simple. 
And anybody who doesn't have to sell or doesn't have to rent or doesn't have to sign a new lease isn't going to unless they perceive there's an opportunity. Um, un until order comes back into the market, we're not really going to have velocity of sales or the confidence overall in the market. And as appraisers, what we try to do is look not only at the, uh, the revenue streams and, and what our, our clients, uh, the banks, are, are, are uh, looking uh, uh, to protect their money that they're putting out, so they also have us look very carefully at the expense profile, because it's not just the income. How are expenses tracking? Uh, fuel is now down to you know, sub fifty dollars a barrel. Well, is 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 that a, a reality for long term, or is that going to pop back up because it went up very quickly, it came down faster? Where is it going to uh, uh, level out? If we could even predict something like that. So, we're stressing not only the income component with um, uh, no growth in rents because the market just pro just will not accept that as a uh, as as a modeling fact for the uh, for the time being. Vacancy increases, as Jamie says. But also the expense profile. We'd be very careful with that. I have a question. You know, both of you, you're global and you're global. We're talking about New York. How bad? You know, New York is always hit after. Uh, they don't. They're not the first to get hit. So how bad is it around the country in values? Oh, well, outside of New York, I think it's worse than it is in New York in in the U.S. Um. Yeah, there are pockets of weakness, uh, Southern California, Nevada, Arizona, where there, where there was a lot of building. Um, but New York is the epicenter of this major financial uh, crisis, and I think the uh, results of that are going to be coming through early next year. And what I mean, if certain parts of the country have their own problems? South Florida, the, re the residential market, there was a lot of speculation, a lot of investor buying, that's gone. The, the Rust Belt is related to the auto industry. The auto industry is under tremendous pressure. There's real fundamental problems in those areas. That's not going to get better in the, in the immediate future. What about the, you know, that hot, hot area known as the hospitality market that everybody thought it, couldn't, it could only get better? How do you see that having an effect in the New York City? Joel, you were talking about it before, part of the show. I think we're also in a, in a bit of trouble in that market as well. Uh, you have 13,000 new rooms coming on next year. Um, Maybe planned. They won't be coming on. Well, um, that's right. Under construction or planned. And you have some openings, soft openings going on right now, and the, and the room rates are, are uh, substantially lower than, than their projections. What's happening in the industrial? You know, there are four asset classes. So we went over residential, office, hotels, retail. What's happening industrial-wise? I mean, I, I think it depends on where you are, but uh, it, um, leasing is not good any, in any market. I mean, New Jersey, very few people realize, is one of the biggest industrial markets around. One of the, one of the top three. Uh, the I top think. three. I did a show last year on the industrial market. They have to be hit. I mean, Port of Newark, where the automobiles come in, you know, all of this has to be uh, affected over there. What's, you know, everybody loved the Gold Coast. What's your thoughts <clears throat> of happening? what's happening in Hoboken and Jersey City with regard to values? Anyone want to? Steve one might know that sure. from a residential. You still have uh, thousands of residential units coming online. These are already in the pipeline, in the development pipeline. Uh, without the, uh, the employment base being the generator for the housing demand, it's going to be a, uh, quite a challenge over there to market all those apartments and to keep the, the occupancy levels up the way they are right now. Um, it's a dire situation until the employment situation turns around. And, you know, we, we, too, too many times we're Manhattan-centric. How do you think the effects on values in the outer boroughs are? I mean, like Brooklyn. I mean, there was so much planned construction for downtown Brooklyn. You know, we were talking uh, prior to my, sh uh, my taping today, you know, about Atlantic Yards, uh, perhaps an ill-conceived idea, because, you know, the, the affordable housing had to be built. I mean, what, what do you see in Brooklyn? I well, mean, you live in Brooklyn. Yeah. Well, there's, I mean, it's, it can be summed up with this one uh, transaction that, that I know you and I know about. There's this piece of land in downtown Brooklyn, probably the best, best piece in downtown Brooklyn, that was just purchased back by the, from, to the owner from the, uh, the financial institution. He bought his note back. And he bought the note back at 50 cents on the dollar. We did a large uh, market study, very micro, on the residential market for five sub, -borough, five sub markets in the borough of Brooklyn. Um, going the, uh, the the crescent from Greenpoint down through um, downtown Brooklyn, uh, based on the current rate of sales, which is de minimis, 
uh, there's at least a three-year overhang in inventory. Just what's there, all right? And if you uh, assume that 50% of the contracts are going to fall out, it starts looking a bit bleaker. So you're saying that, if I'm listening to you, I'm Brooklyn, I'm Brooklyn residential. They, somebody could, if they're really your friend over there who's living on 79th Street, if they don't mind going to Brooklyn and they look, they can be able to get a good bargain in Brooklyn. Is that what you're saying? That's what I'm saying. Also, I think the bargains are going to happen now before the banks really step up and start lending again. But it's interesting that uh, you mentioned before about not having the, uh, the end loan financing, so to speak, to, to stimulate these sales or to affect these sales. Uh, the past few weeks, we've seen sponsors doing five-year financing. Uh, one sponsor is doing a, a guaranteed pricing. Uh, in five years, they'll buy it back for you for 110 uh, percent. Yeah, someone said to me with uh, regard to that, own. they said, what happens, even though they're a very strong person, who the hell knows if they'll be in business in five years? Well, anyway? that's all spelled out in the offering plan. So all those risks are uh, articulated. That's risk. They, it's you risk. Know, they're not Understood. Putting reserve. So, but still, the, the sponsors, these developers are getting creative and going back to almost old school techniques of, of, of moving product in a, in a down market. And with the, and the developers are advertising in ways I've never seen before, such as advertising on Ranger Games. I don't know if you picked up that advertising. Yeah, some of them advertise on 10 Tim Wins. Uh, but, okay, <laughs> but, uh, you know, in summation, how, what do you see in value, because we only have about 30 seconds, what do you see the values dropping next year, each one of you, if well, you see any Well, I see a, a tough time, but I'm ever optimistic, and I believe that when the new administration comes in, there will be a lot of money identified and, and hopefully directed back toward New York for infrastructure, which will create some jobs, which will have a positive impact after mid-year. Slider, quick. All right. Uh, riffing off of that, as we say in jazz, okay. right, the, uh, the employment opportunities pick up. That's great. Money comes back in and loan financing comes in. The housing market gets stabilized. We rise from there. I'm sorry. But it's hard to accomplish everything in 30 minutes. I think my audience, and I, including myself, I think got a lot of insight uh, by your uh, discussions today. I'd like to thank Brian Corker and Steve Schleider, Jamie Malloy, and Joel Leitner. Next week, we have some business people with their perspective on the market. See you next week. Major funding for these programs has been provided by grants from Capital One Bank and Perfect Building Maintenance, Murray Hill Properties, SJP Properties, Greenberg Traurig, New York Community Bank, Bank of America. Additional funding for these programs has been provided by grants from Akron Gold Brothers, LLC, C.B. Richard Ellis, City Investment Fund, Cushman and Wakefield, Eastern Consolidated, XL Realty Advisors, LP, Essex Capital Partners, First American Title Insurance Company of New York, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, GVA Williams, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Helmsley Spear, Herbert J. Sims and Company, Herrick Feinstein, LLP, Jackson Development Group, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, John Katsimatidis, Kilroy Metal Products, Marcus and Millichap, Massey Knackle Realty Services, m and Bank, Madison Realty Capital, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Must Development, Palin Enterprises, Rosenthal and Rosenthal, Signature Bank, Sheldrake Organization, Sterling and Sterling, Stephen Napolitano, Stonehenge Partners, Studley, The Moynan Organization.